All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome, 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 welcome to the first ever episode of Gaming the Industry. Uh, this has been, I guess we could say this has been in the making for unofficially slash, uh, you know, on the back burner for a while, but uh, we finally decided to get off our ass and actually do something. <laughs> um, so... This is this is this is really really exciting because um, basically what this show is going to be talking about. First of all, my name is Shank. Uh, so nice to finally be talking with everybody here again. It's it's really really nice. Some of you guys probably know me already. Um, but before I get into t discussing what the show is, I have my two friends here with me, Mr. Joseph Bradford. I didn't think we were going to get through one episode without you watching the japanese version of my name <laughs> i got to, dude hi everybody <laughs> and uh with us as well is brian the armstrong what's up dude that's right how's it going everybody good to be here very excited for this uh amazing little podcast we have put together for you yeah we are we're yeah what was that well, no, I was going to say, you mentioned at the very beginning that we finally decided to get off our butts and do this. It's because Brian finally said, you know what? We talk about this all the time. Let's just do it. Exactly. and that's I, I honestly didn't think it was going to happen. I just said it, and then, oh, there it is. Okay, we're doing it. <laughs> <laughs> no, and that that's literally what this is. It's just, this is pretty much the video version and an audio version of our text messages. That is literally what this is. <laughs> exactly. Um, so what is it, what does this mean for you guys who are watching this and who are new to uh, this? Uh, maybe you guys have known us in the past, and if you, if you have, welcome back. If not, if you guys are new... Hello and welcome to what uh, we hope you will find to be an entertaining, educational, and uh, intelligent discussion on the games industry. So what are we going to be doing? We're, we're not going to just be simply talking about the games that we play. Because, I mean, you go on the internet, there's, there's a ton of gaming uh, podcasts out there. They're going to talk about games, they're going to talk about genres of games, and that, that's fine. You know, that's totally fine. But we wanted to do something a little bit different because we thought that those... Uh, shows that are out there and maybe some of them that don't even exist yet we thought there was some space for us to do something different so not only are we going to obviously talk about the games that we're playing and love because this is a hobby that we all love but we're also going to be talking about some real consumer issues that I think us three kind of get uh, worried about upset about debate over um, but we think it's very, very important for the consumer and the gamer to understand in order to get a kind of a holistic, better understanding of the landscape of the industry and what exactly you guys are spending your hard-earned actual money on. Mine's not that hard-earned. Yeah, Brian steals all his money. Um, so really... I was going to say, mine's very hard-earned. <laughs> <laughs> so really, we're going to... The plan is to go beyond just talking about games. We want to bring you really good, deep consumer issues that you as a consumer and a gamer should be aware about and hopefully would make your buying decisions a little bit more informed. Uh, we're all gamers here. We play games all the time, um, literally pretty much every single day. So we're huge gamers. We're huge fans. And... Honestly, I think one of the biggest, uh, probably the most interesting part about all this is that none of us will be agreeing with each other 100% of the time. In fact, we're probably going to be disagreeing with each other more than we agree with each other. I agree with that 100%. Exactly. I say, that might be the only thing this entire time <laughs> that we have full consensus on. Exactly. So um, you're not going to hear blind agreement. This is not just going to be pandering to everybody. I mean, we're going to have some, we're, the plan is to get into some really deep discussions here. Ones that you guys hopefully uh, get riled up about and passionate about and discuss with us in the comments um, and on the YouTube videos later. We're planning on putting this up on iTunes. Uh, we've submitted this to iTunes and it's hopefully going to be approved uh, fairly soon. So I guess that sort of covers why did we decide to create this podcast unless you guys had anything else you wanted to add real quick. I mean, for me, it's just it's good to get behind a mic again. Uh, you know, I've been... Uh I do a couple other things on the side, but nothing nothing talking about games. And so it's good to be back talking about games again. And uh, I am just uh, pumped up. Let's get going. That's yeah, that same, same here. I've got nothing else to add. <laughs> <laughs> so I think um, 
There's probably some people that already know us, but for those of us that don't know us and our uh, new listeners, once again, hi. For um, those of us who don't know us. For those of you who don't know <laughs> us. Sorry, I've been sick the last two days. It's cool. Cut me some slack, Bradford. Um, I no, think Professor Bradford. I think it'd be cool to talk about uh, some of the games and uh, genres we like, as well as any of the platforms that uh, we own, because we kind of want to be transparent with you guys and let you know our own sort of personal perspective on things and our library of games, the types of games we play, and as well as the platforms we own. I think that's a pretty pretty good insight into kind of what type of gamer we are. So, Bradford, let's just start with you, dude. What kind of games do you like and what platforms do you currently play on? So, currently, um, it's PC and Xbox One, uh, mainly, though I still you know play some Xbox 360 games because I've got a five-year-old who has started to play this uh, epic mickey game that we got her a while back though recently we've been playing chariot on xbox one a lot that game's so much fun my gosh i'm so happy they gave it away for free um i don't consider myself though a console or pc gamer you'll never you'll never hear me you know say that i prefer one over, over the other uh it's it's i like to play games and whichever one i play it on is just whatever one i decide that i think i would have the most fun playing it on um As far as types of games, mainly RPG and strategy, Um, games that I could die a lot in, (laughs) because (laughs) we know that all happens, though I I still love FPSs, I still love uh, your your platforming games, Um, so I I guess I play pretty much everything, but but the majority of the time, the games I find the most enjoyment in are those long-form RPGs, whether they be Western or JRPGs, and then strategy games, where every single gameplay is going to be totally different from from the last, so... Yeah, that's about it. All right. Mr. Brian D. Armstrong, what about you, dude? I mean, it's funny. I've been actually thinking about this a little bit the last couple of weeks. I don't know why, even before we started talking about this. But uh, I was thinking the other day that really the only games I like are, you know, big, epic, long RPGs. You know, Skyrim, Oblivion, uh, you know, Elder Scrolls Online now I love. Um, of course, I, I also do love games, you know, like I'm a big driving game fan. I'm playing Drive Club right now, even though it's broken. Still playing the hell out of it. <laughs> and, uh, Almost a month after. Yeah. Oh I God. mean, regardless, though, you know, that game is so much fun and it's just such a great driving game that even without the, even without 50% of the features that are supposed to be there, uh, I'm still loving it and having a great time. But, um, so I love driving games, love RPGs, and, it, you know, Really, that's about it as far as the games. that you, If you ask me what games I like to play, that's what I would say. There's other games here and there that come in that I'll, I'll play. Um, but I'm really getting a lot more picky about the games I play lately just because I have so much... Such, so much hmm, I have less time to play than I used to. Uh, so got to be a little more selective. Um, but uh, I have a PC, PS4, uh, PS Vita, uh, Nintendo 3DS, Nintendo Wii U... Um, so I have a lot of things, and I want to get an Xbox One. I'm not, I'm not an Xbox hater. This isn't an anti-Xbox show, um, although I'm sure there will be some times where we're upset at Xbox, but that's not the point of the show. But uh, I really love the Forza series on Xbox, and I hate uh, Halo. So <laughs> that's uh, so be the in effect, my... you are an Xbox hater because you hate the Xbox mascot. <laughs> I guess so. Well, I also hate Mario, so <laughs> there you go. So Shane, uh, tell us about yourself then. Unless uh, you, were, you weren't done, Brian. Oh, I was way done. <laughs> okay, yeah. Shank, tell us about yourself. Let us know what you like. Well, I'm sure we all know. Yeah, um, for those of you who are new to the show, I have a very, very sort of... So when it comes to platforms, I have a pretty straightforward, simple view. I get my consoles for my console exclusives, and I have my PC for everything else. Um, and the reason for that is I actually have my PC right next to my consoles, hooked up to my TV. I'm pointing as if you guys can see it and as if you guys can see it on iTunes, which you can't. Um, But I have basically all this stuff in my living room. So for me, it's literally just a preference of, do I want a console exclusives? Okay, I'll just go get the console. Do I want the, uh, so for example, multi-platform games uh, like a Dragon Age, like Skyrim, absolutely getting that on the PC. Uh, Games like Sunset Overdrive, which is an exclusive, that's why I have an Xbox. so that it's pretty straightforward for me console exclusives play them everything else pc um what do i like to play as far as genres um i'm kind of man i i'm a bit all over the place i love i love western rpgs you know the big sort of epic scope fantasy i really can't play japanese rpgs i i just hate the mechanics in them um 
I, I love, 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 love stealth games. So, you know, Splinter Cell series, uh, Thief, Dishonored, Alien Isolation, recent one, just absolutely love stealth games. Um, shooters, sure, I love shooters. I suck at shooters, but I will play them because they're super, super fun, especially, you know, others, specifically like single player shooters like Metro, Bioshock. I love those. Um, action adventure games, sure. Um, even, you know, Last of Us, I said this a million times, changed my life, really. Same yeah. with Oblivion. And Brian agrees with that. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, really, anything, man. Uh, the games that I do not play, I do not play MMOs. I just, because I'm mostly a single player type of gamer, um, I just don't like MMOs, <laughs> really. Um, and I will never really, you'll never ever see me playing some like obscure indie pixel art. It doesn't even have to be indie, probably just some pixel art game. I just don't like that. Um, which actually brings us very neatly to the next bullet point here. So what do the three of us, each of us, what is the number one most important thing, most important aspect to a game uh, to each of us? So the absolute number one thing that is important to us. Uh, Brian, what is the absolute number one thing that is the most important thing to you in a game? Well... Gosh, it, it's it's tougher than uh, it should be for me to answer. Uh, I graphics are definitely becoming a lot more important for me, uh, just because you know <laughs> when you pay a lot of money for a PC or even the consoles, you want to get the best you can for your money. So I want my games to look great. I don't want to have to hear you know spoiler alert. I don't want to hear that the company doesn't care what the what the uh, uh, frame rates are or the uh, how much, what the resolution is. Um, you know, I, I don't want to hear that. I want to hear that they gave everything they could to that game and it turned out great. And um, so it, it's definitely probably number two on my list. It's creeping up to number one, but just because I have so little time to play these days, I have to say that uh, the game has to be fun. Um, I, God, I don't even know if that's true. That might not be true. <laughs> I can't pick number one. Jeez, Brian. Because uh, it could be story, too. Silent Dante in the, in the chat just mentioned story. You know, Last of Us was a great example of a game that had an amazing story that made me love that game. So... I'm just going to say, I don't know. <laughs> All right. No, no, no. That, I, can, that's, I can't pick one. No, and I, that's the nature of games, right? Because like the games are constantly evolving, constantly maturing as the landscape is kind of undulating beneath our feet. So that's that's a very relevant answer. Mr. Cool. Brad, Mr. Bradford? Um, well, the number one most important thing in a game to me is whether or not I enjoy it, whether or not it's fun and interesting and does something new. Um, so... When it comes to new and innovative gameplay mechanics and stuff like that, um, that is more important to me than the way the game looks. Um, I, and I think that's evidenced by the fact that I've recently reviewed a game where all of the graphics are literally circles, triangles, and lines. <laughs> okay, But I still was, had so much fun with it because the story, there was no story. I mean, there kind of was, but it really wasn't there. But the way the game was presented, the way the game handled, the way the game controlled the premise behind it that was so good and so well executed that the fact that this thing could have easily run on a nokia phone from like 2006 um, <laughs> meant nothing to me um so when it comes to what i look for in a game it, it's going to very be very much based on whether or not i'm going to find the game enjoyable and then you know if the game looks good um i could play a really crappy looking game but if i had fun it wouldn't bother me one one bit it's still important, you know. You, you still have to show that you tried to make the game look good. Um, but if, like, again, using this this game uh, as an example, it was specifically designed to look that way, and so it didn't bother me that it that it had literally no textures or anything like that. Um, if a game is is vaunted as like this great next gen looking experience, but it doesn't look good, then I'll have an issue. But more so, it has to do with. You know, ex again, how the game handles and how it plays. Um, as long as it's fun, as long as I don't want to throw my controller across the room, I'm good. <laughs> Shank? <laughs> throw your controller across the room. Um, yeah, um, those of you that do know me, you know my answer already. Uh, but for <laughs> you new folks, and hopefully there's some new folks uh, on iTunes and whatnot, um, number one most important thing to me in games and really the industry at large is graphics. And the reason why I say graphics is because graphics is, whether you like it or not, whether you admit it or not, the first time you boot up a game, subconsciously, consciously, it is the first thing you notice about a game because it's literally right in front of your eyes. I mean, that's what you see. 
Um, and on, also, I, 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 it's kind of, if we zoom out a little bit, that's what I love about the industry is that the thing that I look forward to most in the industry is the sense of progress. I want a march of progress. I constantly want new benchmarks, new yardsticks, you know, basically those old benchmarks broken down, those old yardsticks broken down and new ones laid out in front of us. And that is, and honestly, graphics and tech, that is literally the clearest and easiest way to uh, look at that. Because I'll give you an example. The story of uh, The Last of Us, a story. Um, people had the ability to write that, you know, in the 90s, in the 80s, in the 70s. Hell, Lord of the Rings was written when, Brad Bradford? Over a 15 year period between 1939 and when it was published in 1953, 54-ish. There you go. So, I mean, you can always have, you can basically write a good story whenever. You can compose beautiful music whenever. But you cannot visually, technically bring those kind of things to life. Like, the story could have worked in the 90s for The Last of Us, but to go for the visuals and the immersiveness that they wanted, that tech because it just literally didn't exist in the 90s. You couldn't have done it. Would it have been as impactful? I would argue it probably wouldn't have because a lot of the impact was the visual story, was seeing the visual interactions between Joel, Ellie, and everybody else, everything else in that game. So that is why I love the graphics and the tech, is just, and that is why every single cross-platform game, you will see me play it on the PC because... Even if the graphics aren't optimized out of the box, you can mod it, you can do whatever the hell you want with it and make really, really push your hardware and get squeeze the last cent of your value out of your machine. And uh, Actually, I got a quick question for you coming out of the chat room, actually, this is a good one. Yeah. Um, when, you, when you talk about graphics being good, uh, what is it that you're looking at? Because does a game like Borderlands look good to you, or are graphics being judged by looking realistic? Like, for, what's what's a good graphic appearance to you? For me, there's a very distinct difference between art style and actual graphics. Uh, for example, uh, Borderlands has a very distinct art style, but it has poor graphics. Sure. Uh, Crisis Three has a very average art style, but it has incredible graphics. So I think there's a very clear distinction. So for me, I value graphics more than art style, honestly. Even yeah. though you can get games that are just knock out, knock both of them out of the park. I mean, really, mm -hmm. you can get just beautiful, beautiful games. I think Journey is a great one. Really pushed the PS3 and had very, very beautiful art style. Well, and I'm, I'm going to couple that with you can still have great art style and poor graphics and still have an enjoyable experience. I mean, Borderlands is, is still a great game regardless. No, it's not. And, okay, well, <laughs> whatever. Uh, but there's a game in my mind that, that's sticking out to me that kind of, in my opinion, and you guys may disagree on this, but The Long Dark. It's got an amazing art style, and I think it, it works well with what they're trying to do with that game. This is a game that is created by Hinterland, Hinterland Game Studios up in Canada, and it's about your you know your plane crashes from this geothermic uh, catastrophe, and you have to try to survive. And when I was sending you screenshots and stuff, Shank, you were, you were texting me back saying it kind of looks like a painting. Mm -hmm. um, that's a game where I think you don't have to have like the most cutting-edge graphics if the art style lends itself well to what they're trying to do. Yeah, no, and another game, you know, you say painting, Dishonored, that entire game looks like you're moving through an oil painting. Yeah, and mm -hmm. you, it could be argued that the graphics in that game are underwhelming they considering, are, yeah. you know, what that studio has put out before. Not that studio, but that publisher. Mm -hmm. So, Yeah, so, you know, for me, it's it's really, I do value, like, for example, I will never say Dishonored is an ugly game. I will never say The Long Dark, for example, is an ugly game. Uh, because the art style really does hold up in those types of games, but if you had to, if I had to pin it down, I want photorealism, and I want, I just want it because that, if anything, is the benchmark for the the technological progress which I value most in the industry. Um, I mean, good lord, Bradford and Brian know how many times in screenshots I tweeted them with Rise and all that stuff that when I was playing <laughs> it on. So. Um, and that's the other thing too. I will play a game purely for the graphics, even if the gameplay is um, absolutely uh, very, very average, like it is in Rise. I will still play it because it looks very, very gorgeous. So, 
hopefully that gives you guys a little bit uh, background on all well, the. Yeah, go ahead. And I'm gonna I'm gonna jump in real quick. We had some some answers from the chat room too. Raw Russ is saying is saying story is always number one for for him. Mechanics second, and graphics are third. Um, Whaler is saying story or gameplay combat. Uh, so everyone has obviously different opinions on this, and it doesn't mean one is better or more, um, you know, more important than the other. We just all have different tastes. But the great thing is, is all of these tastes, when done well and done, you know, in a cohesive way, will usually mean a great game, no matter what. If you have a studio that that focuses on these things and does them all well, you're always going to have a great game. So. Mm-hmm. I'd, I'd have to and like agree. you know like rise i mean rise like you just said they've they and this is this is something that crytek you know has al- always had this kind of looming over them since crisis gorgeous photorealism average gameplay <laughs> yep so it, it, it kind of sticks with the studio too yeah so with that i think um hopefully that gives you a, a a little bit better understanding into our minds and the way we approach the industry at large and the games we play and why we play the games we play and even how we play the games we play. Um, this being episode one, I thought it would be a good idea to take, kind of take a look at the current landscape. And we're, we're sort of setting this up uh, because it's going to, like from here on out, is going to generally be relevant for not just uh, our future shows and our future episodes here, but really for gamers going forward. Um, and, you know, the industry, not just gamers, but like the developers, publishers, really like the, the gaming sort of community at large. And so by no means is what we're going to discuss here exhaustive. Rather, it's a pretty high level overview um, and looking at perhaps the number one issue that's tied to the release of every single AAA title, um, especially since last November. Why since last November? Well... Last year, last November, we had the two new consoles release, the PS4 and the Xbox One. And the last numbers I saw, and you guys correct me if I'm wrong, but the PS4 has effectively continued to outsell the Xbox One. Yeah, I think the last numbers I saw, PS4 is upwards right around 10 million. And the last reports we saw from Microsoft has been um, about five. So, So, and... There's a myriad of reasons as to why this is possibly the case. Um, so, and then of course you have Nintendo kind of doing its own thing. Um, as Splatoon <laughs> looks amazing, so don't count the way out yet. <laughs> Dude, I, I was telling you, uh, I think I was telling both you guys, I want a new 3DS literally just for Smash Brothers. Like, I don't even care. I just want it for Smash Brothers. That's, I don't even care. Why. Like, Smash Brothers. You know, Brothers. both of those things are out in the wild right now. You could go to the store and get them. <laughs> yeah, I could, I could, but... The new 3DS has a faster CPU and like a bunch of this other stuff. So, and it's coming out next year. So, I, I for me, honestly, at this point, I'm gonna just wait a few extra months and just get the whole nice thingy there. But anyway, Nintendo continues to do its own thing as Nintendo has always done for ever. Um, but I think it's fair to say that the number one major hot button issue right now in the industry for every AAA game and for every quote unquote hardcore gamer um, continues to be resolution and frame rate. Now the resolution and frame rate issue, well, what does that mean um, in case you're new to this? Basically, there have been a lot of games there has been this basically this assumption that 1080p 60 frames per second is would be like the standard basically for this uh, quote unquote next gen consoles being PS4 and the Xbox One. And time and time again, we've seen that a lot of games have failed to uh, live up to those standards. For example, a lot of launch games, Battlefield 4 on both consoles did not run at full resolution. Uh, they did run at 60 FPS most of the time, but not full resolution. Uh, likewise, you have Infamous Second Son, 1080p, not 60 frames per second. Uh, you know, Titanfall, 792p, sometimes sort of 60 frames per second. So this is such an odd. It resolution. makes no sense. Yeah, I don't even understand. <laughs> well, Watch Dogs was the same resolution on Xbox One, 792p. 70, yeah, and then it was 900p on the PS4, both 30 frames per second for that game. So you're you're seeing a lot of games just failing to hit what is an industry standard of 1080p HD resolution. And 
and you you already kind of sort of touched on it, but I want to make an emphasis to to note that it's not just third party games that are doing this. No. It's also no. first party games. Yes, you, you mentioned Infamous Second Son. It hit 1080p, but still ran at 30 frames per second. Destiny, which is a cross platform game, but is only made for consoles, 1080p 30. Mm-hmm. And then the newest you know IP from uh, from Microsoft, Sunset Overdrive, is 900p 30. Mm-hmm. So. Um, it's not necessarily an issue of because they're having to, you know, port these to the other other console. Um, it's it's very much tied into probably the hardware itself not being able to reach this. Yeah, and then of course you have Ubisoft in their own little corner, <laughs> pissing everyone off. <laughs> but I think in order to really understand this issue, now you're going to see a lot, and this is this is honestly why we wanted to kind of start this show is that. There's so much misinformation out there, just so, 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 so much misinformation saying, you know, well, hey, you know, 1080p 60, it's it's not really a huge issue. Uh, You know, why can't you, you know, 900p to 1080p, is it is it really a huge difference? And then (laughs) you really it's interesting because you, you get a lot of people saying that, hey, it's only 180 pixels. That's a lie because it's not. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, it's just the other way. <laughs> yeah, so if you, if, you actually, if you actually do the math out, it, yeah, it's 180 horizontal pixels, yeah, not sure. Perfectly. But your actual pixel count is way, way more. And if I can do the math here real quick... You don't have to. It's okay. It's a it's a lot more it's than a lot of peas. It's a, yeah, and I actually knew this number off the top of my head at one point, which is sad. <laughs> thousands, right? It's thousands. It's a, it's a, yeah, it's hundreds of thousands of pixels yeah. that 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 you're just not seeing on the screen. So it's not 180 pixels. Let's get that out of the way. It's not 180 right. pixels. Yeah. 1080p on a 1080p. I mean, think about this. If if those other resolutions were standard, why don't we have 900p TVs? Why don't we have 792p right. TVs? Well, to be fair, my monitor is 900p. You're, you so. have a monitor, right, right, right. You have a monitor, right? But that's for your <laughs> that's for your PC. Which is scalable. Which so, is I mean, scalable, can... exactly. So that, that, that really is not an issue on a PC because that's kind of the point of a PC, right? You can customize your experience. You can get whatever resolution to performance trade-off you want. That's kind of the point of a PC. Yeah. Consoles, by nature, are static. So you code and you develop a game to one set of hardware, which you know the hardware. So everybody sort of has a standardized experience versus a PC, which is scalable and you can do whatever the hell you want. So the difference is not 180 pixels. It's a lot more. It's a hundred thousand. It's a few hundred thousand, if I remember the the number correctly. Uh, yeah. That's a lot of pixels that you're just not displaying on the screen. Second. A lot of people say, hey, there's no real difference between 30 FPS, 60 FPS. It's cinematic. No, that's not true. If you wanted cinematic, you'd get 24 frames per second. 30 FPS is objectively worse than 60 in every single possible way. It just is by every single measure. Well, and and a lot of developers will usually use 30 FPS as the lowest benchmark for Mm -hmm. a playable game. Yes, exactly. Um, That's why it's, it's the bare minimum that the game needs to run at and yeah if they can't get 30 they're not going to release it i mean that's... well yeah and and i, I wouldn't i i would hesitate to the cinematic uh, that the 24 fps with the movie uh comparison because it's it is different uh it's they're absolutely not having, different they're not having to create a a movie that has to do 30 24 frames per second at any given second depending on what the person behind the the controlling the movie is doing so hitting 30 frames per second on a video game is a lot harder than simply running a movie at 24 frames per second because they have to make the game hit that benchmark consistently while it while the player is interacting and the the picture is constantly changing at at the touch of a button so yeah and uh, that's the other thing too is like you know in a movie There's a reason why you have motion blur, and it's related to the shutter speed, which I won't really go too much too into detail here, but there's an actual reason why you have motion blur. And in a game, as Bradford said, it, you don't have a, you know, a, a director of photography perfectly lining up every single shot and keeping all the action perfectly square. Everything is moving around in a game. So you, because of that, you, higher frames per second, you can react it's more responsive. Everything is just more fluid. You would want the 60 FPS because it is, by every objective measure, better than 30. So 
You know, yeah. Shanka, somebody in the chat room uh, said, what about the argument that these machines have uh, recently been released and the devs will learn more about the hardware as they go? And that's, I mean, I'll let you chime in too, of course, but I, obviously that's that's definitely true. They will get better, but the problem is, is that they're behind. And, you know, the, the PC, as we talked about, is already displaying these games in, you know, higher resolution and better frame rates uh, now, and PCs are just going to keep getting better over the next few years, whereas the PS4 and Xbox Ones are going to stay where they are. They can't get any better than they are. Uh, the developers are going to squeeze every ounce of you know uh, power they can out of, out of them, but you know they're, well, they're and, behind, and they're going to fall farther and, behind. And before you answer, Shank, um, that is something that we saw throughout the last two console cycles because you do have better looking better performing games at the end of the console cycle than you do at the beginning of the i mean just look at gta 5 for example mm-hmm. if you just said that that game was going to come out when we saw the first screenshots of <laughs> gears of war which when gears of war was first announced at e3 everyone's brains literally exploded because it looked so good well it's a little bit i don't i don't want to say it's different because um well okay i guess it is um they are obviously going to get better but I think the issue here is is not so much that they're going to get better coding for the for the systems and making those games better, but what is it going to do to the other side of the equation? What's it going to do to the PC side? Um, I, and I'm not a PC elitist by any stretch of the imagination. I could care less um, <laughs> personally. But you do have to wonder, are they going to have to tone down on what the PC versions can do to compensate for what the consoles are limited by. We're only a year in, and we're already hearing developers saying they're squeezing every last ounce out of these. Okay, I'm going to rephrase that. We're hearing developers say that about the Xbox One. (laughs) Well, They're already squeezing every last ounce out of it. To be be fair, uh, I mean, Brian and I have been following Drive Club, and time and time again, Evolution have stated that, you know, they're really pushing the PS4. You know, and that's 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 kind of what we're hearing. So mm-hmm. it's yeah. really both machines. But, you know, I think if we if we really want to understand this issue, I think it's really important. I'm not going to get too detailed into this because this is not a, you know, a technical deep dive teardown, but it's really yeah, we'll imp- be doing that probably in future episodes. Yeah, but <laughs> it is important to understand these two machines that that are sitting before me here. Um, the PS4 and the Xbox one, they're both based on x86 architecture, very simply. That's the same architecture that's on the PC. So very, very high level, the two consoles are PCs. They also have very low power CPUs, low clocked. They're 1.3 and 1.6, I believe, are the clocks gigahertz versus you can get CPUs now. I have a quad core three and a half gigahertz. There's literally, I mean, there's no comparison. The reason they do this is because and when you make a console, you're developing to very strict power limitations and heat limitations. Those are kind of big, uh, kind of the point of a console, really. Um, and they also have, all of this stuff is on an APU. An APU has the GPU and the CPU on the same chip. A lot of advantages to this. It basically cuts out a lot of overhead. So your, your, your CPU and your GPU can talk to each other a lot cleaner. That's a very, very simple way of looking at it. They also have large pools of RAM, 8 gigabytes in both. However, the PS4 has DDR5, D- GDDR5 which is the same type of RAM that you get in uh, discrete graphics cards on PCs. The Xbox One has DDR3. That's the type of RAM that you see in system RAM on the PCs, not on GPUs, just in your system. DDR3 is worse than GDDR5 if you're want if you're talking purely for gaming. Now, the GPUs in both of these, if we t- if we look at these systems overall, I think it's fair to say that the PS4 and the Xbox One are mid, are comparable to mid-range PCs from 2012. Now let's think about when these were released. They were released in 2013, which means the specs had to be locked down probably, I don't know, a year or so below. Well, that well, makes sense. The specs had to be locked what they were in 2012 for yes. production to be able to commence. Yes. Now there, so. you know that then that that there's something very important to be had there. And it goes back to what I was saying about the, the, the heat and the temperature and the, the actual power usage, the watts, the wattage that you'd have to use. 
I honestly don't think that they could have made the PS4, which is a more powerful, objectively more powerful of the two, I don't think they could have made it more powerful than it already is and stayed within the, the heat envelopes and the, the power dry envelopes that they wanted. So naturally, it was going to be quote-unquote underpowered for 2013 anyway. And we look at what happened in the PC space in 2013. What did we get? You know, we got the Titan Z, we got the 290X, we got the 290, we got the 780 and the 780 Ti all in one year. That's a huge, like, if you're talking about gulfs in performance, that's huge. Uh, I, For reference, I have a 780 Ti in my PC, which is no longer the fastest graphics card in the world, by the way. But I have it and I've overclocked it so, such that it is now roughly 6.2 teraflops. If you look at the GPU and the PS4, it's roughly 1.8 teraflops, which is equivalent to a GTX 680 or thereabouts. Mm -hmm. Or 6, 660, not 680. You're, you have a huge gulf in performance there. And a lot of that has to do with you know the design that they wanted to achieve, the temperatures they wanted to achieve, and the power usage they wanted to achieve. But the problem is... You have modern gaming engines. You have ga uh, Cry CryEngine is a kind of a, a uh, exception here, but you have other engines that are very, very advanced. Look what happened to Watch Dogs. Look what happened to Assassin's Creed Unity and that kind of BS with that. These engines keep evolving. And in order to hit 1080p on the already outdated hardware of the consoles, it is going to prove difficult. You can do it, not saying it can't be done, but if you want to achieve all the technical bells and whistles that you would get, for example, on a PC game, it's going to, you're going to have to make some sacrifices. And you're, you're looking, you're talking about resolution. These consoles are struggling to hit 1080p in a lot of games, whereas on a PC, on a quote unquote high end PC, if there's such a ceiling for those things, you can, I mean, you can... Well, well, there is. I mean, my wallet can only afford so much, so whatever <laughs> PC I buy is a high-end PC. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, you you can see games you capable of doing... You can see rigs capable of hitting 4K60. 4K60. You can get three monitors that are 4K and get the game running at 30 frames per second, which at 4K, I will take 30 frames per second on three monitors. So... <laughs> And with consoles still kind of struggling 1080p, 900p versus the 4K, there's such an unbelievable, unfathomable gap, which I think a lot of people are kind of overseeing the fact that, you know, yes, they are in the right to demand 1080p 60 gaming. I don't think that that's, that there should be faulted for that. But what I think they should, there is a fault on the consumer side for failing to understand that you know what, it's actually might not be that possible right now. Well, and uh, to kind of move things along a little bit, um, we we don't always necessarily, like, okay, I don't care about resolution yeah. personally. Um, it, is it pretty? Can I play it? I'm happy. So, But I, I do understand that it should be something that, that shouldn't be a question. These These things that if we can do it on the PC... You know, we should we should demand that that they're able to do it on the five hundred dollar piece of hardware we're sitting there that that we just purchased. But to kind of attack that from a different angle, though, when I bought my Xbox, I knew from the beginning it was never going to be as powerful as my PC. So I oh, same I don't, here. <laughs> I, I don't I don't look at it from that. I don't demand that from from a piece of hardware that I know is it's not going to happen. What I want in that is I want it to be as as fun as possible. I want the games to play as, as well as they possibly can. And I want games to work when I get them. Unlike, you know, uh, a certain developer of a certain cops and robbers game, assuring us making a big press release that says the game will work when we give it to you. That should be a given, you know, uh, it, the game should, should, should function. <coughs> and drive club. <laughs> I'm yes. Thank you. Drive club. I wasn't even talking about drive club. Actually I was talking about, I know I was talking about battlefield hardline, uh, but I, to me, I'm okay with them skimping on resolution if it means the gameplay itself is going to improve. Because, in my opinion, that's that's my most important thing. Um, and a perfect example of that would be the game that came out this week. 
I mean, Sunset Overdrive is not 1080p 60, it's 900p 900 30, but it's a legit fun game. <laughs> it's it's a game that you can sit there and play for hours and hours and hours and okay yeah you might wish for better anti-aliasing here you may think that okay they could have done this better there but at the end of the day did you have fun playing it okay so the resolution in the end didn't matter because the game was still fun you still enjoyed it you still got you still in the end got what the developers wanted you to get out of it which is entertainment we'll see i would i would actually have to disagree with you to a point there because I'm one of those people who will notice a lack of uh, anti-aliasing and like I did. all these I other. I brought that up because of the text last night. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 and no. But see, like I, I, I am having a lot of fun with this game, but I know for a fact that I would be having more fun if it was more refined visually, just because those things genuinely do bother me. If I see jaggies, that really does bother me. Um, if I see low quality shadows, that genuinely does bother me. So then that affects my fun that I get out of the game. But I think honestly. If we go one step further here, I think a very valid question is, quote unquote, whose fault is it? You know, why can't we get 1080p in these uh, uh, consoles? Now, let's let's forget about 60 frames per second for, for a second here. Just let's focus on 1080p. You know, whose fault is it that we can't get 1080p? Is it Microsoft and Sony for creating weak hardware? Well, is it- here, real, real quick, before you before you move on, uh, Silent Dante in the chat is actually asking a question based on that last statement you made, that if it was 1080p, you would enjoy it more. His question is, if it had been 1080 what would it have added? I mean, what does it, it add, seriously? Um, for me, personally, I can't speak to everybody except for the 60 frames per second. 60 frames per second is just objectively better. You can You can argue with me that you prefer 30 or 60, but debating which one is better is really a moot point. It's like debating is one plus one three. No, it's two. Done. Well, and and <laughs> to, to, to make an example of that, I've played Shadow of Mordor on both PC and Xbox, and I feel like I have enjoyed it more on Xbox because even though my PC is able to hit, you know, you know above 60 frames per second of that game, I don't have the fluctuations like I did on my PC on my Xbox. My Xbox is static, 30 frames per second. I don't have... I don't, I don't have any noticeable drops, and I do have that in certain instances on my PC. So right, um, so exactly. No, I, you can, I preferred that, even though I don't own it anymore. So. Yeah, no, no. So that's that's a good point. I mean, you can prefer one or the other, but to say thirty is better than sixty, that's actually not true. So so, but okay. To, but to, to his uh, question, to the 1080p port portion. What would it have added? It would have. First of all, there is. I there's. I personally, in that specific game, I do notice, <clears throat> excuse me, what's called upscaling artifacts, just a general sort of blur that's in the game where textures are not quite as sharp, uh, effects aren't quite as sharp. This also has a pretty noticeable effect on aliasing jaggies. If it was full resolution, there would be fewer noticeable jaggies aliased artifacts. So. It would just basically the image would be cleaner, and if it was 60 frames per second, it would be feeling a lot smoother, especially in an action-heavy game. You would feel a lot more responsive, moving around, you know, grinding on stuff, jumping around, turning around, shooting stuff. It would just feel more responsive. 1080p would have just made the image a lot crisper, and honestly, to me, it would have immersed me in the world that much more, and and I wouldn't be, I wouldn't notice that. Oh, hey, it's slightly blurry over here when. You know stuff like it's just. For, I notice a I notice a few things that I don't think normal people notice. But yeah, and, and I I'm I'm with you. Like I I don't notice all the things that you notice. I I try really hard, and then I say, oh, that's missing this, and you say, no, actually, it has that. I'm like, oh, okay, well, I'm just. <laughs> but but for me, what makes me upset is when these games come out and they don't have these quote unquote next gen numbers behind them. The 1080p 60. I mean. I feel like in this generation they need to have those and it makes me mad that they don't. And so for me, it's not so much that I can see something is wrong, although occasionally I can, but for me it's also like, well, this game isn't everything it could have been or should have been. You know, if I if I do my job at work and it comes out less than average, you know, I get, you know, uh, kicked in the ass for it. And <laughs> I just, I feel like if if we're not holding the developers accountable, and I, I'm not saying, you know, you know, Joe Schmo developer is the guy at fault here, but, you know, the, the the bigger suit guys upstairs are the ones that are saying nope good enough we got to ship it cut it off there and i feel like those are the ones that are that are hurting the industry hurting the industry hurting the pc market and uh you know even if i can't tell the difference between the, the anti-salinizing and the you know desalinization <laughs> plans 
um, <laughs> which is my favorite thing to do to you in text, by the way. Um, it, I know that something is wrong with the game, and I don't like that there's something wrong with the game. So, so yeah, I mean, and that kind of that sort of ties back into you know the kind of whose fault is it question. And this is a very this is an open ended question because I really don't know if there's a solid answer to this. But Microsoft and Sony for creating weak machines, is it the publishers for convincing the public to care about their shiny engines? Because let me take you guys back to E3 2013. How many times during that demo did we hear X game in 60 frames per second? How many times did we hear that? Three. All the, like, we heard it. I was going to say, I mean, I was so overwhelmed because Brian and I were there, (laughs) so I don't think we were keeping track of 60 frames per second. I I was buying into the hype at that point, Shank. Sorry. I was, I was at E3. Yeah, no, it's, it's cool. I was, I was. It's a whole lot different being there. Yeah, I bet it was, but I was, I was watching it here and I, I could not believe how many times I had heard X game in fluid 60 frames per second. Yeah. I can't even tell you how much, and a lot of that is because a lot of these publishers, will showcase their shiny tech and this goes back really to the 360 era you know they were pushing for high definition gaming they were pushing for the consumer to be like look this is what quote unquote next gen at that time is it's hd graphics it's full hd graphics look how much better this looks and then the arms race began you had unreal engine you had cry engine kind of do the arms race Gears of War. You, okay, real quick. When you said arms race, I pictured like uh, an old Soviet-style map with like Ubisoft and EA over here amassing troops and everything, and like you know little tiny Crytek. You know, even though it's a smaller studio over all of them, having like the biggest missile. So. <laughs> no, I mean that's really what it was. You mentioned Gears of War earlier. Why were people blown away? Because it looked ridiculous, right? Well, I I thought the chainsaw and a gun was really cool. that was awesome sure that game too. but it that that game basically became the poster child for unreal engine at that point and you had all these publishers pushing and shoving hd high definition graphics down our throat in a time when the consumer genuine generally your average consumer didn't know what hd 60 fps all this stuff was and now now that the consumer has matured now that the consumer understands this is what 1080p is this is what 60 frames per second is really and i honestly believe it's due to the resurgence of the pc platform but now that the consumer knows this and understands it now now the publishers have the gall to say you know what it's really not that big of an issue people are dropping 60 frames per second as a standard Yep. When, in fact, you were the ones that got made us care about these graphics and the tech engines in the first place. Why did you show us a tech engi- a tech demo of Unreal? If you, if you didn't want to show it off, why did you show it to us? If you didn't want to show off what this you know, Assassin's Creed Unity engine can do with all the NPCs, the Snowdrop engine can do in Division, why bother showing it to us if you didn't want us to think that this is important? Yeah, and, exactly. Uh, you, you, well... Go ahead, Brian. I was just saying that that's that's the issue for me is that I I if I didn't know Shank if Shank was not part of my life I I would have been like oh cool that sounds great sixty frames per second and I would have come back and they would have told me oh it's not that big deal I would have been like oh okay cool but now that I'm I feel like I'm more educated and I know what what is possible I think that's that's what it's for me it's what's possible and the stuff that we're talking about here is not that. I mean, I, this is a dumb thing to say because I don't know jack about making games, but putting a game out in 1080p 60 should not be that difficult in this day and age. You know, the, the PCs can do it just fine, no problem. Um, but that same game can't run at those same resolutions or frame rates on, on console. And, uh, you know, if, if you're going to tell us to be excited about something, you know, I guess stick to it. I, I lost my train of thought. Well, and, okay. Before I speak my point, I just want to say when you said, if I didn't have Shank in my life, I just pictured <laughs> Michael Bolton and Kenny G behind you singing, Tell me how am I supposed to. Yeah, anyways. It's time to bring up my fishing boat again here, maybe. <laughs> maybe. Wow. Um, okay, so I, 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 I'm going to kind of echo a point that, that Dante said in the chat room. Um, I feel like the peas thing is an offshoot of the way marketing has taken over games more than, Hey, is this fun? Um, and, and that's the way I think, you know, when I was looking at, when I was sitting at, at, at E3 this year in the, in the Microsoft uh, press conference, and they were showing me Assassin's Creed Unity, 
I wasn't like looking at it from the angle of, oh, this game looks really cool, or dang, there's a ton of people on screen. I was looking at it as like, would I have fun with this game? Would I enjoy doing what they're doing on screen right now? And so I don't look at it from, from a standpoint of this has to be HD. Now, I would be lying if I didn't say that that mattered because it, it obviously does. You know, I'm, I'm constantly trying to, especially on like games like Skyrim, I can't even play Skyrim anymore because whenever I get into it, it's not the way I want it to look. And so I spend the next two hours modding the game and not actually playing it. If you, ever, if you have me on Steam and you've ever noticed when, I'm, when Skyrim keeps popping up, Joseph is now playing Skyrim. It's because I've logged out, tweaked something, and logged back in. Um, to Shank, that is playing the game. See, <laughs> I don't like that, though. I don't... I, I can't... I've ruined one of my favorite games because I'm not happy with the way I've made it look. And so I don't look at games from that standpoint that if it's not the biggest and best-looking game, I won't, I won't enjoy it. And I don't think that's what you guys are saying, either. I... I even someone like Shank, who values graphics over everything. Um, again, I'll point back to Sunset Overdrive. You've, you've mentioned that you have serious concerns about how the game looks, but all day today you're like, this game is really fun. This game is really fun. Yeah. So in the end, while it may matter, it's not going to intrinsically ruin an experience for you unless it's just so abysmal and it it's not playable. And I think that's what kind of has to be pushed more than, than graphics. And it's going to take time, obviously. If the developers want us to focus more on the art and the the different ways they're pushing this medium and not so much on whether or not this has more P's than another thing or whether or not it's running at double the frames than this thing, it's going to take time. But that's the way the marketing needs to go. And I would make a s- very strict distinction. It's marketing. It's not the developers themselves. Every single one of these developers has a hired PR firm. And so it's it's not necessarily the developer that's pushing this kind of material out. Now they have to provide it, so obviously they're they're working in tandem. But a lot of this stuff is driven by marketing campaigns and it's driven by what's obviously working. So as Royal Russ says in the chat room, to some degree it's the consumer base's fault for buying the systems. So realistically if we keep buying them, they'll keep making them. Yeah, it's our fault too. If we have to if we if we want change, we have to vote with our you know, people say if you want change in the world, go vote. But to do the same thing as consumers. Stop supporting this thing and it will change. Um, as Dante also pointed out right afterwards, he's got no reason to speak with his wall because he's not unhappy with the system, as I'm not unhappy with my system. So it doesn't doesn't affect everyone thinks differently. Everyone has a different mindset going into these things. Um, it, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, and honestly it's 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 just one of those ironies of the AAA market for for the last seven years shoving the tech and the graphics down our throat and now that we call them out on it no it's not important guys no you can't you can't just you can't just do that 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 that's really how this works if you want us to care about your game for, look at all the indie games that were announced No Man's Sky okay look at that in E3. Did they ever once, other than talking about their the procedural generation of the engine, of how they created the worlds, not the graphics, the worlds, did they ever once talk about, oh, this is the type of ambient occlusion, look at this amazing AI tech? No, no, no. They, they, they literally, their trailer has no talking. It's just a ship flying around doing nothing for like a minute and a half. And everybody thought it was amazing. If you, that's how you, that's how you sell your game. Like if they want people to respect them, and not called about focus on the parts of the game that makes it a game you know don't don't shove the engine down our throats even though people like me will still probably notice it your general populace won't and what's better you won't be lying to them that's it's very simple i think another portion of the blame you know whose fault is it um and brian and bradford know i do this all the time is it the media's fault for hyping these products and spreading this misinformation on some very harsh truths? You know, I mentioned the 900p versus 1080p thing there. I can't even tell you how many times I've read and seen and heard that it's only 180 pixels. That's false. It's just not. You know, hyping these products, saying, you know, spending a month covering a certain game and then come time for review give it a half, you know, so-so review. After going to all these preview events, all these 
paid for preview events and then it's it's a very very dangerous sort of i think it's a definitely a toxic cycle that's in a lot of the 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 mainstream industry media today which i genuinely and i'm saying this right now i do not respect any of them uh, there's literally th- probably two maybe three people in the industry's uh games coverage that I actually do listen to and I actually respect, and everybody else I just don't respect and I don't I don't trust anymore. I just don't. Um, the problem is that your average consumer does listen to them, does read them, and does trust them. Do, do trust them, even though they're spreading misinformation and that customer has no idea. And I think that's a huge, huge problem because that's just there. That's part of the whole cycle. So go ahead, Brian. Yes, I. I uh, I share your dis- disdain for a lot of the the media, um, for better or worse. I, I do get a lot of my games news from IGN just because for me it's it's simple, it's easy. I don't have a lot of time to you know to scour the sites. I I like Jim Sterling, but I can't watch his videos on my computer at work, so I just I don't. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I get a lot of my news from IGN, and one of the th- and so I I know why you hate them, Shank. <laughs> Um, and I certainly have my beef with them as well. But uh, one of my big issues with them in particular, and this is not just them, this is just something that I started noticing, but they, they do this thing called I- IGN First now, which is where they spend a whole month covering an upcoming game, getting everybody excited about it, getting people pumped. Um, and I, I don't I don't know if it's happened yet, because I know they're doing Halo right now, I think, which is obviously going to get a great review from everybody probably. But uh, my concern is that they're going to bring out a game. Like, you know, if this had been last year, they would be hyping up Aliens Colonial Marines. It's going to be, oh, my gosh, we have all this stuff all month long about Aliens Colonial Marines. And then it comes out, and they give it a 2.5 or something like that. And everybody, everybody just says it's a horrible game. I mean, that's going to happen. They're, they're going to be hyping a game. They're telling the world... Look at all this great stuff. Getting people to go pre-order it and buy it, and then they, the same people who are telling you how great, oh my gosh, this is, looks so cool, come out and give it a terrible score. And I mean, they're completely misleading. There's all, this is a whole other layer of of deception than the, what you're talking about, even. But um, that that thing, that kind of thing, I have a, a big problem with, and I'm just afraid of people who don't pre-ordering games that they shouldn't be pre-ordering because they're they're getting on on the hype train here. Um, I just had to say that. It's, 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 yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I definitely see, it's definitely an issue because worst part is any of these guys can turn around and say, we didn't force you to click on then read this article that you disagreed with. It's like, no, but the article is there because you're telling us to care about it. So, you know, it's, it's kind of like, it's a very, very cyclical type of thing, which again, your average consumer who's not, who doesn't like, you know, live and breathe the industry like we do because we're so passionate about this stuff. They don't, they're not going to know any better. They really won't. And it's not, it's not right for them to spend their hard-earned cash on something that was misrepresented to them. And I think that is, that is, that is the biggest shame and crime here that's going on. And it's horrible. I'm going to point out something though, that, that Dante just pointed out. I think it's something we should all remember. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's that the people who do the, re- the do the previews are not always the people who end up doing the reviews. Um, Which I think is a problem in not, itself. Well, but more often than not, um, a lot of these companies will send staff people to these preview events, but then they will freelance out the reviews. Um, and so a lot of times you have one point of view being being shown. And you're right, that, that kind of is a problem. They should, they should keep it consistent. Um, but it's... Unfortunately, it's the nature of the beast. You don't always have everyone available at that exact time. Maybe they're working on another assignment or they've got another deadline, and so it's easier to freelance somebody out. Uh, for instance, uh, our, our buddy Leif Johnson just did the Lords of the Fallen review, but I, I don't think I saw him write about Lords of the Fallen before this came up. Um, does that mean that any preview stuff that, that was put on you know, so on such and such site was then made invalid because his review may have been different than the preview no it's just two people's opinion and i think that i think we need to separate news reporting and opinion yes. reporting yes opinion pieces previews and reviews are very much opinions news reporting though is supposed to be based on facts and uh, for the most part i'm not as cynical as you guys about this um i i read ign i read polygon i read kotaku i read all of them and there are certain uh, i i 
I approach it the same way I approach any mainstream media, that there's always going to be a hint of bias. You know, when you watch Fox News, you expect it to be a right-leaning slant. Vice versa, if you watch MSNBC, you expect it to be a lot of, you know, left-leaning slants. Same thing here. It, any form of media is always going to be with some bias. News reporting, however, should be completely unbiased and completely, you know, based very much on fact or, you know, maybe there's a rumor or a leak coming out and you're just reporting the rumor, but very much so is telling us that this is just a rumor, nothing's been confirmed, and we'll update you when, when that happens. So um, when, you, when you talk about not respecting a certain outlet, you know, I, I, I'm always concerned that, we're, that we are saying that someone's opinion is invalid just because we don't agree with the opinion. Oh, or no, no, if no. It's, or if it's, you know, based on the overall, okay, maybe their news reporting isn't, you know, it isn't completely factual. Mm-hmm. Or maybe the way that they approach their game coverage, like you mentioned with I- IGN first, and I don't fault IGN for doing that one bit whatsoever because... Oh, no, they're making a ton of money. <laughs> well, and that's just it. These are still, even though these are news, quote unquote, news organizations, they're also businesses. Yep. And so, you go ask any reporter, "What do you want? To, what, what do you want out of a news story?" I want to be first. <laughs> I want to. I want to break the story. I want my name out there to break the story. That's all they're doing with that. Um, well, now, damn it, they need I, to watch the newsroom then. Jeez. <laughs> now, do I do I think that these publishers should, you know? It, if it ever comes out that IGN is buying the coverage, I think that I will have an issue with. Um, but maybe they're being given the coverage because the because the publisher or the the marketing firm knows that they are the most viewed website out there. Um, they don't always get all of the first coverage. You see that on other sites as well. So uh, I, again, to I've gone off on a little bit of a tangent here, but my, I think my main point is is that we need to remember that reviews and, and previews are very much opinion, and you are not always going to agree with those things, and they won't, won't always match because you oftentimes have two different people doing them. News reporting, however, is what we should hold to that higher standard because in the end, that's what's informing people out there because that's what's supposed to be reporting facts. Right, and you can have an opinion, but when, when you say something so casual and so wrong that the difference between 900p and 1080p is 180 pixels and you know that you have millions of people listening to you and well, reading and you and watching that's you the, that's the fault of not not just the person doing the news reporting it's the fault of every editor who then lets that go by without fact checking every ounce of that news and, and again well, that's that's fueled by trying to be first on the story yeah. and, and it's not even that it's it's in their podcasts it's in their videos because they joke about it they make light of it not not just IGN lots of people um, yeah you know it's just sort of it's just sort of thing this, I've said yeah. on the show so far I don't care no I don't <laughs> so. even mean that I mean I mean they'll say oh there's there's uh, all those peas uh, it, they make fun of the issue when it's it's a valid issue and they're making fun of the issue because they don't personally care uh, which causes the masses to but, but the problem is that they I feel like they genuinely don't understand it when exactly. they say when they carelessly say it's 180 pixels yes. when it's blatantly I'm, wrong i'm i'm not going to to say that i don't think they don't understand it I, I think there are people who are in these positions that very much understand the tech side thing but it may just be one of those things that they just don't care <laughs> so you 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 don't have to, to them, care about it to but them see it's that, not an issue right but see that's fine you, you cannot care about it you cannot see it as an issue but you can't as you can't in good conscience knowing that you have so many people listening and viewing you who will not who will absolutely will listen to you and will take you seriously you cannot in good conscience say it's only 180 pixels cuz that's actually not true no no and and again my issue with these with these things are um, if they're going to be sowing misinformation that I have an issue with which is because, what that is my biggest gripe like yeah. anybody i can i that's fine if i disagree with the opinion of someone's review if it's based on sound argument, I can see, okay, you know what? Yeah, you know, I can see why he would not like X mechanic in a game. I might disagree, but I can see why he doesn't like X mechanic. But, and you, I'm not going to say purposefully mislead, but when you mislead knowingly or unknowingly, that's still wrong. You shouldn't do that to your consumer when part of, I firmly believe that part of a journalist's job is to inform the reader. And especially in the gaming industry, is so that they can make intelligent buying decisions. And well, when you and spread misinformation like that, 
I'm going to go out on a limb here and say you should not make intelligent buying decisions based on somebody else's opinion. No, no, no. I, I, I agree. But, you know, getting as much information, uh, accurate information as you, you can to the consumer, I think, is incredibly paramount and important when there's actual money being traded hands here. And so for a lot of people, a lot of these guys to say it's 180 pixels, that's just that's actually false. That's not, that's not an opinion. That's just false. And that's what I take issue with. Not not that their opinions don't line up with mine, but when they say blatantly well, incorrect I, I things. I wasn't accusing you of that. No, 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 no. I understand. If, if anyone could just read our text messages, they'll they'll realize that I have no qualms about the fact that you never know that you never agree with my opinions and you hate me for it because I know you don't. You don't agree with six out of ten things I say, <laughs> but we're still friends. So. Yeah, no, no. So I can I can disagree with someone's opinion. That's fine. But when you carelessly pass off something and just say something as if it's true when it's actually not and millions of people believe you that's a problem well and uh, uh, we're running a little long here but that's um, fine <laughs> um but it personally i don't go to ign for the technical news i don't go to polygon for technical news i go to digital foundry for that because I know they know what they're talking about there. They're doing all of the all of the analysis. They're giving us all the breakdown. So when I read a story on IGN, I'm literally just going there for okay, was this was this release date announced? What do we know about this game? How is this particular yeah. developer screwed up this quote now? If yeah, I want to know kinds of things. Yeah. Um, it, when it comes to like real in depth stuff like that, I go to certain outlets like Digital Foundry for graphical analysis. If I want to know things more based on a PC centric idea. I'm going to go to PC Gamer because they're only reporting from that PC angle. Right. Um, if I want long form opinion pieces, I'm going to go to Polygon because that seems to be what they want to do now. <laughs> so, but but yeah. don't you think even even I mean, even if, but but I'm saying like something something so simple and common sense. I mean, literally, it's very simple math. That's not technical. You know, that's not that's not that's not that's not somebody analyzing footage and saying. You know, you you have four samples getting anti-alias here. That's why you can see the alpha. That that that's like super in depth that you would expect then from Digital Foundry. Yeah, but well, something. I just said that. Yeah, I yeah. Don't expect that from IGN. You don't expect that digital. You don't have that crazy analysis. But if you're a video game website, I mean, it's kind of your job to understand what resolution is. That's a very sort of fundamental kind of thing. It's your job to understand what frame rate is. Again, that's a fundamental, simple thing to understand. If you want to know ambient occlusion, I don't expect IGN to know to even know how to spell that. But to understand fundamentally that 900p and 1080p are different, 30 and 60 are different, that I think it's I don't think it's a giant leap for us to expect the quote unquote mainstream industry outlets to have a basic fundamental understanding of what those things are. Well, and I would argue it's not a basic knowledge thing yeah. because until I met you, I didn't know that i no, didn't care about that no no no, no. So, but you you understand though that 900p is not the same as 1080p right that's fundamental I that. yeah and I, yeah but and, and i don't think i i don't think i've ever heard or read one person say that that is that they are the same i think i've heard them say it's not as it's not noticeable that's important yeah um it, it, go ahead i was say i think uh you know shank you're saying that these these journalists need to. This is basic information they should they should know. But I really, in this particular indus, industry that we're talking about, I don't I don't think that's the case. Unfortunately, I think these guys come from college where they were writing a blog about their favorite games, and they happen to have uh, a very good writing ability and maybe a, a good journalism degree as a background. They get a job at some little site, and it just goes. I mean, they're not sought out because they are you know the. I don't, I don't Peter Jennings of the world. You know, they're they're, they're dudes. I don't, that's the only name I can think of. Uh, they're dudes living in their apartment, playing Call of Duty, writing about it on the weekend. And uh, obviously, some guys put a lot more into it than that. I'm not saying that's that's all journalists, but um, they don't really care. I, I, they don't they don't necessarily care about the technical aspects that that, that we're talking about here that we find important. Uh, you know, they write from a perspective that is interesting to a lot of people that gets a lot of hits a lot of views and at bottom line that's what that's what uh the people who write the checks care about they want people who yeah. are gonna get people to their site they don't care if they don't know what 
uh, what 1080p is. You know, and, um, and don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that that your point is not valid because I 100% agree. If they're going to put it in a piece of a uh, piece of news, it needs to be 100% accurate. Um, if yeah. they're going to tell me that this is news, and then tell me that you know 900p is the same as 1080p, that's factually inaccurate, and I'm not going to trust that. But I, I also don't think that you should discount somebody as a journalist just because they may not understand the intricate details about why it's 900p and 1080p are different. Um, that's yeah. yeah. And that's just that's just my two cents. Yeah, yeah. So real quick, right before we move on, that's fine. You know, as a journalist, if you don't care about those things, I that's hey, you don't care about it. That's fine. You play the games you want, but you can't. Even if you don't care, that's not ground for you to. St- say things that are not true about that yeah. stuff you know and I, yeah. I, I don't think any of us are here saying spread misinformation no. i yeah. think we're all i think we're just saying you know it, it, if you don't care that's great but then don't put a miss don't don't put a non yes in a factual piece yep so yeah that's yeah that's that's what yeah all right bradford what do we got next here um well just to kind of move on because we're we're running late um what can realistically be done? And I think we've kind of touched on this already. Um, my opinion is to just enjoy the, what games we have and wait for the next console cycle. That's probably a little, you know, naive. But, um, <laughs> it, it, and I, I also touched on it before in the episode as well. It does affect PC, so we can't really be that complacent. But I, I honestly think that we should just temper our expectations with what we're going to be seeing out of these new systems and hope to Christ that they port it from PC first. So... <laughs> Yeah, and uh, I honestly like this. This genuinely does affect the PC more than these consoles because I've said it multiple times. Engines are only going to go get more advanced. You know, Cry- Crytek, CD Projekt Red—they're not going to all of a sudden stop developing on their engines. That—that's not—that's not how it and, works. And they're not going to care about what consoles are out there because we can see that. The reason why Nintendo is doing their, their own thing is because their console can't run anything. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so it's not because they don't want these games on their console. It's because they legitimately can't get onto the console. Yeah. So, I mean, that's the thing is like, you know, the PC is only going to get more powerful. There's there's mm-hmm. already, if you think this is like hyperbole to scare people, it's not. It's very real and it's true today. I have been telling these guys, you can see it on my videos. I can get Rise running in 4K downsampled and get a 30 frames per second. That's That's possible today. That's possible today, guys. I did that on my PC, and I think I got one frame per second. <laughs> <laughs> but this kind of thing, this is possible today, and these consoles are stuck. They, they cannot, they can do Rise at 900p. I mean, and it's, it's 2014. It's not even a year since they released. So two, three years down the line, the gap is going to genuinely become enormous because of technologies from AMD and NVIDIA, which I won't get too detailed into here. So what can realistically be done? Honestly realistically i'd have to agree with bradford we can't do anything because these consoles are out they've invested they being microsoft sony have invested millions of dollars into this what i want to happen release new consoles honestly release new consoles i don't care and i don't think a lot of people would care i don't care if they were slightly bigger because guess what one's already big this this 1080p 60 question was gonna happen anyway it was it was gonna happen in a few years anyway but nobody expected it to happen on day one. And that's, that's the biggest issue here. It was going to happen fine. If you could make them a little bit more powerful, they make, might be a little bit hotter. People wouldn't care for the first two years, which is quote-unquote normal for these consoles. After a few years, yeah, they start to show their age. Yeah, they can't make, probably can't do 1080p. They can't do 60 frames per second, but not on day one. And I think releasing new consoles in 2016, 2017, I want that. We- well, and and I agree. Uh, it, it, do I want them to release a new console tomorrow? Heck no. I would love <laughs> but, that, you know, honestly. I don't want them to go another eight <laughs> years um, with me not having... I don't want them to, to use the Xbox 360 and PS3 as their benchmark of how long these things should last. Um, and, and honestly, if you want the best in gaming, we're going to sound like PC elitist here, and... I, I'm not that whatsoever. Hold on, if facts, if we were if we were, we wouldn't have the consoles. Let's. It's literally that simple. That's true. Um, <laughs> that's very true. But I mean, the truth is truth. You know, um, if something is better, it's going to perform the things you put on it better. And it, 
PCs make up a very P, hardcore PC gamers. Okay, let me rephrase that because I know there's a lot of PCs in the wild. Um, but hardcore PC gamers make up a small portion of the overall gaming landscape, and that's why we see the the focus being on these nice shiny new boxes. But in the end, you are you're going to by not having the most powerful thing out there as from day one. Um, you're going to intrinsically infect, uh, infect. It's probably Freudian slip there, but uh, <laughs> affect uh, the PC versions of the game. And and honestly, we've already seen that. Should, yeah, those should be the benchmark. I mean, it, again, these are all based on the same architecture, so really, it should be a save file as type thing <laughs> from the PC. You know, save file as Xbox One or save file as PS4. Um, People are going to care if a new system comes out tomorrow because they just spent four to five hundred bucks on it. Now, with the recent price drop on the Xbox One, making 350. it even less now, and it's not just you know it's it's, it's not just the single consoles; that, it's also the bundles that are getting getting the price drop as well. I'm okay with them, you know, them still being on the market and and people buying them for years to come because they are not as expensive now as what a mid-range PC is. I mean, you could spend 600 bucks on a mid-range PC. Not everyone has 600 bucks. Not every family is going to want to hook up a PC to their to their TV. That's why consoles exist, in my opinion. Um, and but, I'm, I'm cool with that. But I also want people to understand, don't go into the mindset that you're going to have the best thing out there, because it's not. And it's really not. The biggest issue here is that these consoles... Say they say they even do a hundred dollar price drop, right? In two years, so say the PS4 all of a sudden costs three hundred dollars in twenty sixteen. Okay, a mid range GPU you can you could buy a two hundred dollar GPU, a two hundred and fifty dollar graphics card in twenty sixteen, which will absolutely trounce the PS4, the more expensive PS4 in two years. So. That the consoles might fluctuate in price, but they won't go down too too much over the course of the lifetime. Whereas a same for the same price bracket, the same price tier, you can get PC hardware at that same tier every single year. That's just better and better and better and better. And that's the issue because what that does is just increases the gap that much more. And I think Man, that's that's so dangerous for growth. That's so dangerous for the industry. And honestly, the people with the hardware to run it, being the PC gamers, even a mid-range PC in two years, the people with the hardware to run it are going to suffer because it, those games are going to be inherently crippled, inherently gimped, <laughs> simply because the consoles won't be able to do everything. And that's horrible, not just for PC gamers, but for everybody, the entire industry. It's bad. Brian. Now let's... Brian, go ahead. Oh, I wasn't saying anything. Oh. <laughs> uh, Listen, I, I don't want to sell the devs who are making these games short, though. There are incredibly talented people out there that are making these games. I mean, more more talented than I am. More talented yes. than Brian. Maybe more talented than you, Shank. No, I'm not going to assume more talented than you. But, um, so I, I don't want to discredit anything they're going to do. They're going to do amazing things with this. We're going to get some great games over the course of the the uh, the lifetime of these consoles um yeah quick but, interjection five thousand npcs on screen in ac unity that's a genuine innovation that's yeah genuinely awesome the the thing that we are going to all have to admit though and even the most sti stingy console master race person is going to have to come to terms with is as much as i hate to admit it as someone who doesn't genuinely care about the tech i just want fun games um you will have stagnant growth in the industry because they're going to have to there's just way too much money tied up in these things um these these developers are going to have to you know in order to get their their games on every platform possible they're going to have to cater to lesser tier hardware so hopefully and we're seeing this more and more with games you know the game like for instance dying light now being axed on the old gen consoles and only being new uh, current gen and pc hopefully that's a move that makes those two versions even better because they're using the pc as the benchmark um which are three being developed on pc ported to ported to console so hopefully that means what is truly a better overall system those those games stay great and as a result it makes the ps4 and xbox one versions that much better because they're maximized exactly um 
Which Brian, is good you for everybody. Have something? <laughs> uh, no, I, I mean you guys are you guys are saying it all here. Um, you know, I don't know what else there's to say. <laughs> okay. Well, let's move. Let's move on, if you don't mind, Shank. Let's um, let's do it. He's not the best in the business for no reason, folks. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I honestly don't know what to say. Uh, that. that was my uh, my. Uh, Oh, exactly. God. Speaking of <laughs> well, yes. Speaking of World of Warcraft, uh, let's let's look <laughs> over uh, what we're working on. Um, all three of us. Okay, we're, we're, this isn't some conglomeration or anything. This is literally just three people sitting around mics and just talking. Yeah, we're that's, not, that's we're not starting a network here. We're it, not trying to do anything big. We're just got tired of our text messages. Text messages. So <laughs> we thought it'd be fun to just put this out on the internet, and that's that's all yeah. this is. Um, Major League. Damn it, that's where my quote was from. There. Got it. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Nailed it. So let's just kind of go around the campfire here and uh, discuss uh, what we're working on. Uh, let's actually, yeah, let's start with Brian. Brian, what are you, what are you, uh, what are you working on in your spare time there? Oh God, I don't have any spare time. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, I uh, this is not video game related, but I'm going to shout it out anyway. I am still doing my uh, my radio show. I host a uh, progressive metal radio show called Progressing the Metal. Feel free to check it out. Um, but yeah, that's about it. I, I'm hoping to get back into some more uh, video game related stuff. You know, whether it's writing or uh, just talking stuff with you guys. Uh, I want to keep it going. So yeah, that's it. But I defer to you. Uh, so. I do have a YouTube channel. I've been pushing, excuse me, pushing stuff out to. Um, I've missed a week on my Shadow of Mordor lore series I've been doing because work has just been insane. We're moving one of our stores right now, and I have the delivery vehicle. So of course I'm doing that. <laughs> but um, I will actually have the next episode out tomorrow. I, I edited the, um, I edited the video tonight. I just have to do the voiceover and come up with my topic. Uh, <laughs> So uh, stay tuned for that tomorrow. It's youtube.com slash L-O-T-R lore. Uh, also been doing a little bit of freelance writing for Legendary and Media, uh, doing, trying to bolster their gaming coverage. They just moved their site off Middle Earth Network, and uh, I'm really good friends with the guys over there. They wanted to start doing gaming coverage. And so I've been doing that just to kind of keep the, the writing chops up. Um, I'm supposed to be working on an ancient space inter- uh, review, but then Shadow of Mordor came out, and I haven't touched that game since. So I hope Paradox doesn't get mad at me, because that would be awful. Um, and I'm also working on a Civilization Beyond Earth review, so that'll be coming up soon. Right. Um, but yeah, mostly if you want to keep keep in touch, you know, just follow on Twitter, like and subscribe on YouTube, and you'll see the stuff there. Uh, I'm hoping Shank and I can put together some Sunset Overdrive awfulness for you. Nobody we'll, wants we'll to watch have to that. see. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's the multiplayer, dude. Yeah. The Chaos Squad is amazing. That's what that, that was the E3 demo was Chaos Squad. So, <laughs> Shank, uh, what are you doing? Uh, Besides, what what do you have the need for? By the way, we're we're getting. We're I fast. have the need <laughs> for speed. Yes. Crispy. Um. So, <laughs> I have my my own YouTube channel, youtubecom slash shank the tank s h a n k t h t a n k uh i just put random stuff up there i do a lot of graphics and performance analysis because that's what i care about most um my most recent one was for kingdom come deliverance the technical alpha and bradford saw it and cried i'm still crying (laughs) um i lit a candle yeah good example of good example of a game that's in a technical alpha not even in the actual game yet and it looks and runs better than the majority of triple a games out there right now so something to keep in mind um i do a lot of that kind of stuff this show will actually be on its own playlist on that channel just look under um gaming the industry and you'll see that playlist with these uh shows on there and i we had that question in the chat earlier where this is going to be hosted um i think we're doing it that way because we're already having you guys subscribe to another twitch channel Um, just subscribe to Shank's channel. Again, we're not doing this to make any money off of it. We're doing it to have fun. So it really doesn't have to be on the essential thing. (laughs) Shank's the one hosting. Yeah, we are getting paid. (laughs) Full disclosure, it's it's, it's actually about ethics and journalism. Um, We are getting paid. (laughs) Shank Um, is buying me an Xbox One. I'm not buying you guys crap. (laughs) Uh, He's the one hosting the video right now, so it just makes sense instead of having to try to, you know, yeah. send somebody else in mp4 to host it on their channel every single week we're just putting it on shanks to be easy yeah. um so. yeah so actually that brings us neatly to the close um 
where can you guys get more of us if you uh, so choose? And hopefully you found this entertaining, uh, you know, intelligent, open discussion. And feel free to chime in as well. We definitely want this to be an open discussion. Like, I mm-hmm. mean, you can clearly tell that the three of us don't agree 100% all the time, which is a good thing. Yeah, and it, the chat room tonight was really, really getting involved. You guys were great yes. out there if you were in the chat room. A lot of, a lot of good comments on both sides of the aisle, or all three sides of the aisle, as it was in some cases. Uh, so thank you for chiming in, and uh, come back next week. Yeah, yeah I appreciate it. Exactly. So uh, if you would like to f- uh, follow us on Twitter, we are at GTI Podcast. Um, just give us a follow, and you'll know exactly when our shows uh, go live. We're, the goal is to record... Um, every Thursday night at 10 p.m. Eastern Time. We recorded it on a Tuesday uh, this week just because of weird scheduling stuff. But the goal is every single Thursday, 10 p.m. Eastern Time on this Twitch channel, twitch.tv slash gaming the industry. Um, and we're actually working to get the show on iTunes. Uh, it's been submitted to iTunes, just I guess pending their approval. Uh-huh. Uh, if you want to if you want us to talk about something specific that you care about uh that you, you know that uh, as well again tweet us at gti podcast or send us an email at gaming the industry at gmail.com we'll check that and uh check out uh any questions that you might have and if we can answer it truthfully then we'll do it or we'll just bring it up for discussion um like i said the shows will be up on my youtube channel under the gaming the industry uh playlist and uh, I should have that up, uh, you know, the day following the podcast, hopefully. So within 24 hours. Uh, and that channel is youtube.com slash shank the tank, S H A N K T H T A N K. You can follow. One, I'm sorry, one, one more final note on, on where the show will be hosted as well. Uh, for us, Android Master Race people, um, <laughs> we're going to be, I, I'm going to be submitting the feed to Stitcher Radio. Um, that's the best podcasting app on the Android since they since Google Play dropped podcasting support. Uh, so be be on the lookout for that as well. We'll we'll let you know when that gets approved. So there you go, guys. My uh, guess is it gets approved before the iTunes feed does. Probably. I mean, just just I would not be surprised. Um, you can follow us on Twitter. You can follow Bradford at L O T R Lore. You can follow Brian D Armstrong at Silent Fury 7 and you can follow me. At Shank the Tank, S H A N K T H T A N K. Let's say goodbye, gentlemen. Well, okay. Well, thanks again for hanging out with us for this first episode, guys. Really appreciate the support. Um, until next time, Namadi. No thanks, guys. We'll see you next time. My takeaway from this episode they have the internet on Androids now? <laughs> wow. Peace out, <laughs> dudes. <laughs>